Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Kirsten Trainer. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. All right, thanks, Sherry. We really appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the opportunity to expand and grow, and as you'll see in the coming months. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture's been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today, and while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and I guess co-host today, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining, and we're glad you're here. We've got another great episode lined up for you today, and more on that in a minute. Hey, Kim. Hey, Kirsten. How you guys doing? Hey, Jeff. Good to hear from you. Yeah. Good to see you, too. Jeff, it's still summer here. It's 77 degrees today, on the in the mid, almost the middle of November, and I'm sitting inside. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> you needed to quit planting those tulip bulbs. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> 80, 80 some. I got 80 some in the ground yesterday. Wow. How's your back feel? Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of bulbs, I just learned about dahlias in, for an upcoming article in my magazine by Rusty Burlew, and what a great source they are for nectar for, for pollinators if you don't go with the crazy dinner blade dahlias, but the more original ones that have the, the center um, with nectaries that are still visible. So it's fascinating. Jeff, you probably don't know, Nancy, you know, Buzz's wife, Nancy uh, Ryapel is an officer in the National, as they, or the National Dahlia Society. She sponsors programs. She grows a hundred different kinds. I've wow. watched, been watching her dahlias and Buzz's bees for years. Wow, they, I, I know dahlias are a big thing, but I've never really gotten into them. So that they are pretty, though. Interesting, interesting. Hey, uh, speaking of pollinators and flowers and um, honeybees, that's why we're here. There's been a lot in the social media and even in uh, popular press uh, magazines recently pitting the honeybee against native pollinators. That's a uh, pretty big, well, it's a re- reoccurring topic of discussion, isn't it? For a lot of reasons. And I guess today, one of our country's better spokespersons is with us who can address this probably better than either you or I can. That's for sure. So, yes, it's actually one of the reasons I launched Two Million Blossoms is to help um, smooth over this divide because most beekeepers and native pollinator enthusiasts really have the same goals. The, The goal is increased habitat. I mean, the United States used to be home to over 5 million colonies. We're at 2.6, 2.8, depending on growth in the last few years. And in the 60s and 70s, we weren't having pollinator issues the way we have them today. It's not a question of too many honeybees, if you ask me. It's a question of too few flowers. (laughs) Well, that's for sure. I think also, Kirsten, part of that is what is out there, what is available for native or honeybees is the safety of that very land is questionable in terms of is it, can I avoid pesticides everywhere I go? And the question is absolutely not. It comes Another part of this comes down to can I avoid pesticides anywhere? This, this is definitely true. And, and good, good forage land is becoming harder and harder to find. Um, and that's why beekeepers are always looking for those untouched places, those places away from ag lands and away from subdevelopments because homeowners and farmers are, are, are often grasping for pesticides to keep weeds under control. And I mean, the, the evolution of the lawn in the United States with, with powered lawnmowers, you know, we've replaced what we used to have growing in our front yards. We've moved our vegetable gardens to our backyards. And we, we just 
uh, have become a pretty weed intolerant society. Um, and so it's it's very, very difficult when you want that perfect, perfect lawn. We grow way more <laughs> lawn than we grow agricultural fields um, for, for that not to have an impact on both honeybees and native bees. And native bees do forage in a, in a much shorter radius than, than our honeybees. Our honeybees, I mean, I put in a pollinator meadow for, for my 20 plus colonies that I had in Maryland. I put in seven acres. It was completely full with flowers. And I was expecting my honeybees to enjoy this amazing smorgasbord <laughs> I had put in with the help of the USDA, um, the, um, CREP program. And for the first two months, they completely ignored it. I found all these bumblebees popping up. I found sweat bees. I found these hairy legged solitary bees I had never encountered before. It was absolutely fascinating. Were my honeybees in that field? Forget it. They were not interested in the least. It wasn't until other sources dried up that they finally started appearing. Um, so is there competition only when there aren't enough nectar sources? The problem is, to me, I find is not the honeybees versus the native bees. The, the problem is us humans and us tearing up so much of the landscape. That kind of sums it up. Yeah, it does. Um, <laughs> of, it, I, I like your phrase, weed intolerant. That's a, that's a very good, very apt description of almost everybody I know that isn't a beekeeper. Uh, well, and I, I think this this is one of the things, right? We we try to paint beekeepers as awful, but I know so many beekeepers. That I'm not talking about the ones who get into it to save the bees and then are out of it a year later because they can't keep their colonies alive. Those are not beekeepers. Mm -hmm. Those are bee havers anyway. But true beekeepers, ones who are very concerned with their bees and keeping them healthy, they are the best advocates out there for increased pollinator protection laws, for increased habitats in neighborhoods. We're talking about a vast population of beekeepers that are very politically active and very savvy in getting rules and regulations passed to help protect their bees. So I think pitting native bee enthusiasts against honey beekeepers is really misplacing the problem. Isn't there some, I mean, so a lot of times pointed out in these articles or in the discussions is uh, the, the almond pollinations comes into play and the number of bees are in those areas and the holding yards. Uh, how does that play sure. into the whole discussion? I, I mean, I think holding yards can be problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Where holding yards are places where we put large amounts of colonies, very little forage, and then just like kids on a playground, the big guys like to beat on the little guys. Or in this case, these strong hives tend to rob out the weaker hives. And we do know from an analysis of viral um, titers throughout the United States that they usually, when we have new viruses starting to appear in our population, they tend to first show up in California and then they radiate throughout the United States because we are moving so many colonies into California and then back into other areas in the United States. Could we improve holding yards? California is desperately trying to work with farmers to put in more forage on the edges of or orchards, almond orchards. There's now a lot of seed funding available. Um, there's programs, I think it's kind um, the, which is one of the largest purchasers of almonds in the, in the world, they're working with farmers to have bee-friendly certified orchards and will be purchasing all of their almonds from those companies. Those things make differences long-term, mm -hmm. right? Because they, they're advocating with their wallet and their purchasing power. And I think the almond industry is really, really good at lobbying for improvements, not just for almond farmers, but for the bees they depend on. Honeybees are definitely managed livestock. I, I mean... Honeybees in the United States are not at risk of extinction. I do think beekeepers, commercial beekeepers, can be at risk of extinction because it's become more and more complicated to keep hives alive due to lack of forage. The, uh, the argue, one of the arguments, um, we had Brittany Goodrich here a while back, and, and one, of her, one of her goals is to get almond growers even more involved in helping honeybees, and one of the things that you, the second argument you always get is, is there land available to do that, and is there water available to do that? And and when, if I was living in California, um, I can imagine an argument being, I'm going to give water to plants to feed bees, or I'm going to give 
get water so I can have a shower at home. Because in some places in California, it's that that big of difference. There's either water or no water. And if I'm going to have no water, uh, how can I afford to feed honeybees? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that, but it is the question that needs to be solved. Yeah, and I, I think we will probably end up looking towards Israel for a lot of those solutions. Desalinization at the moment is still very expensive. Um, if we can find a less expensive way to make water more freely available from our oceans, it may help solve some of these issues. But you're absolutely right. We're going to be facing more drought, especially on the West Coast. We saw that with with last week's episode where, where we talked with Sharon um, in Oregon and, and fires, droughts, extreme weather events. We, we face more and more of those challenges. And so it's 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 these are not easy problems to deal with. And and. I think we have to think creatively and often outside the box. I have grown accustomed to eating, and <laughs> and I don't want that to change. So, yes, the, these are problems that have to be solved. Well, the honeybees being made this out the, as a scapegoat in some ways, as, as the source of the problem, and as you pointed out, the, the perhaps the real problem is the lack of forage, lack of available space, and perhaps even climate change as all of that changes uh, around the United States and around the globe. I think it's important to have these discussions. Uh, and I just, I, I think we, we don't want to posit a straw man argument, right? Where, where we focus on something that is more a symptom than the actual problem. Um, and, and the solution, even if we got rid of all our honeybees, uh, native pollinators are still under threat due to these very same issues that honeybees are facing. And so I think we need to come up with creative solutions that work for all of our pollinators. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the key, all of the pollinators, because if you solve it for one and not the other, you haven't solved it for either, really. Um, exactly. Not, yeah. So One last question on the subject. Is, is calling a honeybee a not, a, an invasive species, is that an accurate statement these days well i mean it depends it's, it's, on who you ask well it's been <laughs> well so they're, they're definitely not they're definitely not native to the united states and i would say that with the the africanized with the app um in south america and the way they've come up through the united states you could make the argument that those are invasive because they are spreading beyond their initial introduction point are European honeybees that we manage in the U.S., um, invasive. If you ask Native Americans, they called them white man's flies, and they predicted where settlers were coming. So perhaps they they are invasive at that time period. However, we've also brought over all of these European crops that depend on pollination from those managed honeybees. And I would say that with parasites and pathogens, the feral population has in many places collapsed. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't call European honeybees in the current situation invasive. They're a managed pollinator. Are, are cows invasive? Um, I guess that depends on your perspective of whether they're showing up in your lawn and munching your flowers. <laughs> so, well, There was, uh, some time back, there was a discovery, I believe it was in Montana, of an apis species bee um, fossilized. Yes, there... Correct. There's a fossil. It's, I believe it goes back 30,000 years. We did at one point have a honeybee species in North America that died out. Um, however, the, the honeybees that, that we manage in the U.S. were brought over from the, the European population. So it's kind of like so. the horse. There were horses in North America at one time. They died out, and the Europeans brought them over, probably pulling carts of honeybees. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I mean, I mean, invasive, native, non-native. These are all human terms that we put on things to describe how our ecosystems function, right? Mm -hmm. And um, would would honeybees eventually have ended up in North America? Probably not. Um, but they've been here for at least five hundred years, mm -hmm. and we are we are very very dependent on them. Um, it's the same with dandelions, right? Dandelions are not native to the United States, but on no classification list do they appear as invasives. They they spread more than homeowners might like, 
Um, but they do not become unmanageable and take over the way kudzu takes over. I, I would say that honeybees do not have the same impact as something like multiflora rose or kudzu, which are truly invasive and on many unwanted lists. Yeah. As, and as out here, scotch broom, it, it's really invasive yeah. out here. All right. Any closing thoughts, Kim? No, I think uh, I think we're not done with this uh, problem no. Because uh, I still want to eat, and <laughs> that kind of keeps things moving along. So, I I fully concur. I think this will be a reoccurring issue, and I do think it it it's it's important for beekeepers who are very active for habitat improvement to voice how they actually participate in changing the conversation. Um, and I, 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 there's a wonderful article called The Gordian Knot that really talks about this political engagement of beekeepers and how valuable it is. Where was, I'm sorry, where, where was that article? Um, it, it's a peer-reviewed paper that okay. was published uh, in 2020. I, uh, I can give you the link and we can put it in the show That'd notes. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. For, thanks for uh, joining in that discussion. Um, I'm sure we'll be coming back to that. Hey, Kim, you talked about eating. You eat bananas? I love bananas. Yeah, love bananas. Kirsten? I am a big fan of bananas, and I do enjoy and do enjoy them on occasion. Have you either of you fed your bees bananas? Wait a minute. What? <laughs> yeah, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember, so several episodes ago, Kirsten had Simeon Valkenberg on the show. He talked about feeding bananas to his bees and it kind of just stopped everybody in their tracks and so we asked him where did he hear that and he told us and so on this show we were able to get katherine davit on to talk to us about her research and what she found about uh, feeding bananas to bees interested in listening most definitely <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm glad to hear it because we have it coming up and, and that'll be right after this quick spot from Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Well, I want to thank Katarina to, uh, for joining us on the Beekeeping Today podcast. Welcome, Katarina. Oh, hi. Thank you for having me. It's nice yeah. to finally meet you. You know, Katharina, uh, we first got uh, wind of what you are doing when we were talking to the beekeeper from Australia with Kirsten, and he referred us to your paper on feeding bananas to bees, and that's why we're here today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry if we giggled during this. This is this is been. I've been looking forward to this discussion ever since we heard uh, Simon talk about, uh, Simeon talk about this uh, a couple episodes ago. Yes, yes. So I quite often get the jokes and the giggles about the bananas. That's right, well, I pretty bet. common. I bet. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and and, and your beekeeping, and uh, then then we can get into why you started studying bananas and bees. <laughs> okay. So um, my name is Katharina. I was born and raised in Germany, in Berlin. Um, I left after the wall came down with a big chunk of the wall taken with me. Um, that, of course, dates me. But <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, yeah, so later on, I started beekeeping, and then I joined the Master Beekeeper Program. But in my lifetime, I didn't only live in Germany, but I also lived in Africa. And what I learned in Africa was from the natives there that very often they do things that are not very commonly accepted in the Western world. And so what I have learned while I lived there was listen and watch. You may learn something. 
And I certainly learned a couple of things where we Westerners probably want to raise an eyebrow. So really, you know, and that was the same thing with the banana. So like in 2017, I was in one of the online fair, uh, for, forums and I was talking to beekeepers worldwide and there were some African beekeepers and uh, it was uh, nectar dust at that time in Africa. And he said he was feeding bananas to his bees. And I was like, really? Why? What's the benefit of it? And he's like, well, it raises brood by 10% and increases honey production by 20%. And I'm like, really? Is there any research about that? And certainly there was. He gave me one link. And so I read the research. It was done um, in Nigeria by Akiwanda, um, a professor, by the way. Uh, now, now he's a professor. And I thought it was really interesting. It was written well. And, you know, was the study done the best way it could have? Probably not, because they captured swarms and put them back in the hives during the experiment. But it was more like a point saying, hey, there may be something there. And um, as I was searching further, I found some other research uh, in other nations like India, um, in the Himalayas, for example, that did some research for three years. And they all had the same conclusions that it does increase brood. But the question was, how does it work? What, is, what in the banana is increasing the brood? That was the biggest question. Well, and that's well, Ka- Ka- Katharina, research. just wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but before we get any further uh, on this, because yeah. Yeah. this is going to be the first question, first concern of everybody listening to the podcast right now. They're, yeah. on, they're frightened right now because everybody in America knows, or in North America, anywhere, you don't eat bananas in the bee yard. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. What are you talking about? So can you talk about that before we, we go much further into your research and what you found? Yeah. So so I was uh, actually running a short test um, on behavior of the bees to see how they act if we have bananas swinging in front of the hive, if we put it in the hive. And what I learned really quick is that the IPA, um, which is a part of the alarm, alarm for women complex, um, which people attribute to the artificial banana smell, does not increase the um, aggressiveness in bees. And if you look further, IPA is used in perfumes and cleaning supplies and hair products in uh, um, soaps of our clothing. If that would cause aggressive attacks by bees, the industry would not use it. They would not. That's really clear. Um, so, but part of the alarm for women is it's a complex of different for women. So and IPA is basically the, the main carrier saying, hey, pay attention. We have to do something. So IPA elicits bees to do something, but it does not set, tell the bees that they have to sting. It just tells them that they have to do something. Mm-hmm. The other for women, they tell the bee what to do. So what we notice is when we take the banana and we slice the banana in half and just slapped it on top of the bars and we squished it down, they were calm until we squished it down. When you squish it down, then you get the attention. <laughs> then you get maybe a few that bounce off on you. But as soon as you put the lid on, they let go. They're not pursuing you if you walk to the next hive. Mm-hmm. So as a beekeeper, if you apply bananas to the hive, if you mess up as a beekeeper, besides putting the banana in, you may get stung. Yes. You know, if you drop a frame with a banana on it, you're probably going to get stung. But, you know, but banana itself does not make bees aggressive. All right. So we have shown that in our tests. Um, that was, uh, I don't think there are studies out there um, about that. But you can basically test it. And if you go on YouTube and you Google some videos, I've seen some videos of guys standing in front of the hive, you know, you know, slapping the banana over the front entrance and nothing happens. So, um but yeah, it gets their attention, but it does not make them aggressive. So you don't have to worry about getting attacked. And All right. so and I don't know. I've eaten I've eaten banana before, worked my bees and no difference. You know. All right. So. Well, thanks for clearing that up. I hope that uh... <laughs> that's the first thing I was here. You know, people say, Yeah, uh, they're gonna sting you. And I'm like, no, they won't. So if I go back to um, you know, when I heard from the African beekeeper, that was winter here. Mm-hmm. And we had in February, I believe it was February or March, we had some warmer days and just enough to take a peek and see who's flying and maybe kind of do a peek under the lid real quick if you had to. And so everybody looked good except one colony. And so the colony wasn't flying much. So I took a peek under the lid and there was not much left. They had plenty of food. 
But the boot cluster, well, not the boot cluster, but the bee cluster was so small. It was basically, you know, when you open up a winter hive and you're like saying, well, they're dead in a week or two, you know, and you're kind of like, okay, you close the lid and you just walk off because you have written them off. I was at that stage. And then I thought, you know, how about putting banana in and see what happens? Well, I mean, they were dead to me anyway. So I figured putting a few overripe bananas, which we had in the kitchen anyway, in there, see what happens. So I fed them bananas. And by the time we had the first nectar flow, this colony was as strong as all the other colonies. And that gave me an indicator there was something to it. And I did not know what. I could only guess, but, you know, there was something to it. And so that's when I started researching more material about it. And um, I was also in the, in the Montana Master Beekeeper Program. Katrina, I want to interrupt you for a second. <clears throat> you gave it one banana, just one or did you give them one a day or one a week or one a month? How, how, what's the. Yes. So what I did with this, with this colony, I give them banana pieces, not a whole banana because they were too weak and I couldn't eat it all, but I kept on giving banana pieces until we had the first nectar flow. I just and continued. That's, that's, a, that's a banana in the pe in the peel or just yes. a banana inside. Yes. Yes, so I took a banana, I sliced this in half and then cut it into pieces and put a visa peel on it. And the peel has to be ripe, very ripe. So if you look at the banana, the banana should look like it's yellow with freckles on it. If it's not, if it doesn't have freckles, it's not ripe enough because it needs higher sugar concentration. And also there's some other uh, like dopamine and the amines that get higher as the banana ripens. However, if the banana peel is black, then all the moisture from the peel moved into the pulp and the peel becomes hard and the bees can no longer eat the peel. Mm -hmm. And for them to eat the peel is one major key of this whole story. And That's so about the I, time I throw out bananas is when they get really freckly. Yes. Right. They're too ripe. Yeah. We always end up with some like that. And so don't throw them out, utilize them. Your bees will take them. So yeah, so um, so that colony survived and give me an ind indicator. So, and of course, I was in the Master Beekeeper Program by the University of Montana uh, under Dr. Bromenschenk. And if you're in the master level, you have to do a research project. It can be a literature review or it can be an actual test. And the way they run it is you have to put in a proposal of what you like to do. And they're either going to say, yes, you'll go, or they're going to shut you down. And my proposal was that Cavendish bananas, those are the bananas you find in grocery stores here in the U.S., uh, improve bee health. And uh, Dr. Promenschenk right away said, no, not going to happen. This is all anecdotal. There's nothing to find. <laughs> and I said, no, no, wait a minute. I have some material already on it. And there is something to it, but I tried to explore it. And I have to say, Dr. Promenschenk sh shuts uh, things down when he thinks that you may fail and he does not want students to fail. So he has a valid thing. So he's not evil. He's a good person. He's very valid about that. He'll be happy to hear you say he's not evil. That'll <laughs> yes, be... no, I don't want to make him nasty. He's a nice guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he had a valid point. He doesn't want you to fail. And I said, look, you know, I have something there and I like to explore it. And any research, even if the outcome is negative, is still research. It answers the question. And that's what I'm trying to figure out here. And so he was consulting with Dr. Dale. And Dr. Dale is uh, pretty known in nutritionist when it comes to bee nutrition. And he was looking into what I had uh, to say. And he said, yes, I like to see this. This is interesting. This is something new. We haven't talked about anything like that. And so they let me do it. I provided a good document. Dr. Broman said it was a high A because we taught him something new. And he's happy that he no longer has to, you know, think about all those anecdotal things that are out there. <laughs> so it was a good thing. You know? yeah. so, so I was happy. But what they didn't tell us is if you teach the professor something new, you get an A grade. I didn't know that. But, hey, I'm proud of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> If you taught Dr. Broman Shank something new, then, yeah, you deserve an A. Or high yeah. Well, I keep telling people, uh, if they're in the program, you have to think outside of the box. Don't do what other people already did. Try something new. I mean, you don't have to be a professor. You don't have to have access to university. You just have to be open-minded and maybe catch something up if somebody su suggests something. That's how I kind of slipped in the bananas with the African beekeeper. Before, I wouldn't have thought about it. So anyway, then um, I was looking, basically what I was doing, I was analyzing what's within the banana and what's within the peel. 
And there's data out there because some countries actually use a peel to make flour out of it so you can bake bread from it. Something you never heard in America, right? Yeah. Well, but, banana bread, yes, yeah. but that's not okay. – it's a different the peel, thing. The peel is, peel is high in starches, so it's a good bread, except <laughs> when it gets ripe, then it becomes mushy. But, you know, but in African countries, they utilize what they have. And that was part also of some of the research that had been done in the past is how can we feed bees during nectar dust when the African beekeeper doesn't have a car, he walks 10 miles a day, you know, he lives in a shack, he doesn't have electricity and he needs feed that is either free or very low cost because he doesn't have the money, he doesn't make enough money. And so they were looking at what uh, people were growing in their yards, what they could utilize. And banana came up because it is high in sugar. I must say, banana is not high enough in sugar content for honeybees. Honeybees like it sweeter, but they will utilize it if there's nothing else there. And so, so I was looking into it. So I needed also uh, something to compare to um, what we know about nutrition. And the sad news is there is not much about nutrition out there since the group in 1953 who did actually nutrition analysis on amino acids on honeybees. There is not much out there when it comes to all the other elements. And the only uh, research I found was actually done in Australia by Mr. Black. And he wrote two books about it. You can actually download online. Um, and it's actually published by the government there. And he went now further looking what bees need when it comes to minerals, vitamins, and et cetera. So that was my base to compare to what banana has in content and what is considered actually very good for bees. And so I found out real quick, you know, carbohydrates. Yes, bananas are sweet. Overripe bananas are really sweet. Um, they get up to 23% sugar contact, while, um, while bees prefer 30 to 50%. So if you want to feed bananas, don't lay it in front of the hives. They won't touch it. It's, it's just too much work. But if you put it inside of the hive, they will eat it. Hmm. And um, but what I also found out is um, that bananas have about 70% sucrose preferred sugar for bees. Uh, bananas do not have any of the known toxic sugars, which is good. So you don't have to worry about poisoning bees with bananas. Uh, vitamins, not very, not, not of high value to bees in there. So you can forget the vitamins. Uh, let's see, minerals, really good sources of minerals. And the one that stood out the biggest is potassium. Are these in the pulp of the banana or in, in the banana peel or is this in general? Very, very often they're in both parts, but sometimes one item is higher in the peel than in the, in the uh, pulp. So um, you should always feed the uh, pulp and, and peel. Um, the peel is high in, um, in dopamine. You don't find the dopamine in the pulp. So that's, that's why you want it. And I can explain why that is important. But p potassium is very important because if you look at research, it shows that bees seek higher potassium sources in fall for winter survival. And one of the researches by uh, Neil Scott showed that bees that eat a lot of potassium in fall actually deal better with viruses during winter. And with varroa, we know that winter bees have viruses. So if there is something that suppresses a viral activity in their body, that gives them a better winter survival rate. So potassium, we know bananas high in potassium. So you feed some bananas and fall to your bees and you load them up with potassium to give them a better winter survival rate. Hmm. So um, I thought that was interesting. Another thing that is very interesting, well, there are no lipids in it, so you can forget it. Um, there's no amino acids in it. In bananas, we know that it's a sweet product. Um, there are, um, let's see, the amines, like dopamine and serotonin, are both in the peer present. And they increase, actually, as the peel ripens. And in my test, where I did behavioral test, I was trying to see, because most beekeepers say, oh, you know, you put, you know, you put the peel in a shock boot hive, and the shock boot hive will just, you know, take the peel out and do hygienic behavior, and they kill the shock boots that way. Well, in my test, I found out that they were not discarding the peel. They were eating it. You know, you, you can put, uh, you know, a tray in front of the hive and see what they discard or see what's on the bottom board. I never found a single evidence or piece of peel there ever. Hmm. They were eating it. Uh, Catherine, <coughs> excuse me, a quick question then. You mentioned, you mentioned feeding the peel and the colony that you fed it to that had chalk brood. The chalk brood 
symptoms anyway uh, were reduced or went away. And, and it wasn't because of hygienic behavior, apparently, because they yeah. were eating the peel. So was there something in the banana peel that yes. is working against chalk brood? So I must say there is no research supporting that peel cures chalk brood. There is none out there. So I call that actually a plausible part. And the reason why I call it plausible is as the peel decays, it releases gases like, um, let me see, um, like acetylene, and as I think there's another gas, I don't find it right now, I have it somewhere here on my desk, but I've hit it somewhere. It releases gases, and those gases, they have done tests where they took oranges that had mold on the skin, and they put um, banana peel with them, and they let the gases release, and they noticed, and there's an actual study out there, they showed in the study that it actually suppresses the spore growth in those oranges. So that's why I call it plausible, because I think <laughs> it does the similar thing in the hive. Now, is it really curing it? I don't know. But at the same time, we know that the nutrition in it, the potassium and the amines in there, actually puts the bees in overdrive. And I think maybe that helps with the suppression of it. But then on the other hand, when you have a shock boot colony and you feed them up and you make them stronger, they can overcome it. So that's why I call it plausible what they're doing in Australia. I'm not saying that the peel is going to cure it. I don't, I, I don't have enough uh, proof of that. Maybe somebody else can do a study on it, but there is no study out at this point. Yeah, so the study was done by Huan Patton and Hana, Hanavati, uh, shown that it inhib inhibits the growth of a mold growth on oranges. But it was done on oranges, not in the hive. So, But it is plausible. Um, the amines, which are mainly serotonin and dopamine, they are causing hygienic behavior in bees. They, they put them actually to work. Mm -hmm. And so you find them, for example, uh, also in the brood, um, that hives that are high in dopamine, um, the brood, uh, they can raise more brood and more sustained brood for a longer time if they get dopamine. And that puts the question, should we add dopamine and serotonin into our bee patties? Maybe, <laughs> because there may be something to it, you know. But uh, if you look into it, you know, what dopamine and uh, serotonin does, um, there is really some effect on bees on that one. So um, also serotonin decreases the responsiveness to IPA. And that means if the bees get more serotonin, they are less aggressive. They stay more mellow because they don't respond to IPA as much anymore or to the um, alarm for women. I call it happy bees. Keep your bees happy, I guess. Yeah, the same and, effect uh, on people, too, the Yes, yes, serotonin. it does. You know, um, serotonin also affects uh, the behavior, lifespan, reproductive cycle. So it has a big influence on what's happening in the hive. And the banana peel is high in those components, and the bees are eating it. So I think there is a lot to it. I, I always tell people, put the bees in overdrive if you give them serotonin and dopamine. So, <laughs> you know? so in 2019, after I finished my master beekeeper, I said, it's, it's time to do a re-up study and see what happens. Because some of the studies have shown 10% up to 16% increase in brood. And I thought, well, let's see if we can replicate it. The only difference is the other studies, they maybe just, uh, you know, blended it up and filtered it, or they filtered it and added more pulp to it, or they added some honey to it. You know, they didn't give it straight up. They just processed it in, in a way. And um, so I wasn't, I just wanted to do straight banana. So I want to see how it goes. So we bought packages from a uh, from a breeder down in California. I created custom boxes that were holding six frames in it and a special feeder on top. And the feeder on top had actually a sugar syrup feeder and it had a compartment where you can put the bananas so that be right on top of the frames. Hmm. And so and then we bought frames. Um, they were from Man Lake plastic foundation. So everything was brand new. Nothing was contaminated. Um, the, the packages that came from the same source, they had the same queens, they were all Canadian queens. And um, so we installed them and we started feeding bananas. And we kept on um, measuring the weight and see how they were doing. So what we learned real quick was actually the control group that did not get the banana was getting faster, heavier, while the one that was getting the banana was not getting heavier, but was expanding faster and brood. So apparently honey weighs more than brood. So that's something we learned real quick from that. <laughs> um, but what we were really interested in was actually seeing how much brood they had on the frames. 
So we were coming and counting the surface of each frame, how much brood they had, you know. So we were actually saying, okay, this frame had a quarter, was quarter full of brood or had none or was full. So we were going by that. And we were running this experiment for 30 days. After 30 days, the banana group, they were so busting full of brood that they did not have space to put honey in it. They were so brood bound, they were close to swarm on us, basically. And so we had to stop at that point, otherwise I would have gone further. But what we noticed, all boxes had six frame in it, and the ones with a banana had one extra frame of brood after 30 days. So our calculation came down to 18% more brood. And I'm like, wow, that's something. Well, I mean, considering how cheap banana are, and we did not give them pollen patties. So all the protein was coming from outside. They had to forage for it. The only thing they got was sugar syrup and the bananas. That's it. And that's so that was pretty interesting. Yeah, so um, I suspect they were doing a little bit better here than the other studies that were done because, um, because we were not blending the banana. I, my guess is that if you put the banana in the blender, you oxidize it. That's my guess. That's a wild guess. Um, but they blended it and they, they watered it down with sugar syrup. So maybe that's the difference that we give it straight up. Um, I talked to a friend who's a beekeeper in Oklahoma City. He had 100 colonies. And in that same year, he was feeding bananas. And I'm not kidding. I have a picture of it. He was putting six bananas at a time in one colony. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, here I'm with my 200 grams max per week. You know, <laughs> he was putting six in per week. And the way he did it, he said, well, he was testing. First, he put it outside. Outside, nobody would touch it. He put it on, on the entrance, very little activity. He put it on the top bars. Yeah, they were taking it. And then he saw, what about if I put it between the brood chamber? So he cracked the side open, put six bananas in it, closed it up, and walked away. And so it, what he noticed is that the bees were expanding brood so rapidly that he had to spend about $140 a week on sugar to feed them because they were expanding so crazily. So I guess because he gives so much, you know. But he also noticed that out of 100 colonies, 95% made it through the winter in Oklahoma City. He said he never had such a high winter survival rate. And I thought it was interesting. Um, I did not do a winter study because I don't have enough colonies. And also there are too many variables going in when you have a colony like that. So I stuck with my REAP study because it was easier. You start up from scratch. You don't work with something that's already existing. Well, Katharina, but there's obviously some nutritional advantages to doing this, and there mm -hmm. is some, <clears throat> excuse me, some management advantages. Uh, if I'm I'm listening to this for the first time, how yeah. am I? What? How? How can I incorporate? feeding bananas to my bees into my management pack. You already told me about packages. Yes. So I can see that next spring <clears throat> when I get packages, I'm going to I'm going to try this with some of my packages. Right. But right. for my overwintered colonies, um, yeah. if 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 there's a honey flow on, will they eat the bananas? Will they only eat them when there's no honey flow on? Good. How does good that work? Question. Very good question. So when we did our behavior study we were giving them in, in spring some bananas and they were consuming the bananas. But as soon as we had a nectar flow, they started ignoring the bananas. So, so they made a decision there. And I get sometimes a question, people say, oh, you did bananas and they want to feed all year round banana. And I'm like, no, you don't. You should have a purpose why you feed a banana. You don't just snap <laughs> nearly really bananas in the hive for no reason, right? <laughs> yeah. Are you feeding, and either with packages or my colonies next spring that are overwintered, am I feeding just bananas or bananas and sugar syrup or bananas and sugar syrup and pollen patties? Um, what's, the, what's the mix here that is going to do best, do you think? It depends on your goals. So if you want them to build wax, you should give the sugar syrup 100%. And I would give sugar syrup anyway because bananas, when they're overripe, they go only up to 23% sugar content, while bees prefer 30 to 50%. So you should give them sugar because there's just not enough sugar in the banana really to make them happy. I think what they really like is the nutrients in it, the minerals and uh, the dopamine. So I'm looking, I'm looking for a balance of both, the bananas yeah. and sugar syrup. 
If I mm -hmm. feed sugar syrup and bananas at the same time, the bananas are going to stimulate brood production, and the syrup mm -hmm. is going to be able to be there to help to help feed them until yes. there's a honey flow. Yes. And once that starts, all right. And I'm I'm putting in a. I asked you this before, and I I'm not sure I understood. A banana yes. a day, five bananas a day. Put one in and wait until it's gone. Right. Put five in and right. wait until they're gone. Right. Right, right. So I was very conservative by going maximum 100 grams of banana, which is a quarter banana a week. Um, but as uh, as uh, Jason showed me, you can go much higher. Um, I would suggest only to put as much in as they will consume within a couple of days because the banana peel will dry up. And once the banana peel turns black, they won't touch and just leave it in the hive and you see mold on it. So don't put a bulk load on unless they take it. Um, my suggestion is, Feed banana if you want to rear up. For example, if you need to go to pollination, you want to make sure your colonies are really strong, I would say, yeah, feed them for two or three weeks with bananas and see what happens. If you rear queens, you may want to feed some banana too because they're raising brood, you know, and you want to make sure the queen is off to a good start. Fall, winter preparation. We know that the potassium, bees seek potassium in fall. We know that, that they're needed for winter survival. So I would say give them some in fall. But I would not give it to them if the bees are, you know, busting full the hives and they're doing honey. You know, I wouldn't do it at that time. Um, and it's probably too early in this to, to be able to give an answer. But yeah, uh, you, do you have any any thoughts on cost analysis of this relative to if I'm going to produce brood uh, versus I'm going to produce honey? Uh, do I feed sugar or do I feed bananas? Um, because to be honest, yeah. I have no idea how much bananas cost. So <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. We always end up with some that are overripe, and then either you freeze them, make bread out of it, or you say, oh, well, I'll give it a weak colony. So when, if I have a weak colony, I just give it to them sure. first. And I would say, you know, stay on the moderate side. Don't go over crazy. Don't force it down the bees. You know, just put, you know, on the top bars. Don't break up the brood cluster unless you really want them to explode like crazy or force them. Put some on the top bars, put the inner cover on, put the lid on, walk away and see what's left in the week and then maybe we top it in the week. So okay. we have been, as I said, we have been putting 100 grams in, which is a quarter banana. So one banana does you four hives for one week. That's not expensive. Well, Jeff, I can see one thing right now. Yeah. Um, I know I know we got, we're going to move move along here, but I can see one thing is I'm not going to try this this fall because I don't want right. a ton of brood. Yeah. So next spring we're going to have to come back and revisit this and try some try some uh, try some I, <laughs> different mixtures. I, 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 have to, I have to tell you, I do it in fall, but not six bananas per hive. That's not going to happen. <laughs> if you put like a quarter piece of a banana per week in it and you do it for two months, you're not going to increase brood by much because it just doesn't stimulate them enough. Yeah, I might do it okay. just to see if they like it. They will yeah. like it. They will take it. And I think there's a health benefit to it. And, you know, you want your bees to go healthy and strong into winter. You just don't want them in, in winter in fall starting wearing new brood. That, that's the wrong thing. You want them to go strong in winter with their winter bees and not replacing them with summer bees. Well, very good, Katharina. We, we, we're we really at the end of our time right now. And, and, yeah. and really thank you for being on the show and having uh, this discussion with us. I'm sure you'll get a lot more feedback and vis visits to your website and some questions from listeners, I'm sure, because this will stir up a lot of lot of yeah. questions. Well, I have presented this at uh, different uh, bee conferences in the past because I was invited and, you know, so I went yeah. to Tulsa and Salt Lake City and a couple of ones. Um, Nashville, Nashville was beautiful. Um, but, um, you know, I can always present over Zoom, you know, so if a club mm -hmm. is interested, um, you know, I can do that. Um, it's a possibility. I have wonderful slides to go with those wonderful pictures. You can see things. And and uh, actually, my slides I always share with everybody. So if somebody's interested, you can download my slides, read through it, and, you know, see what I have to say. I think that about wraps it up, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Well, Katharina, yes. appreciate you, you being on the show and your husband in the background. I didn't catch your first name. Husband? Paul. Paul? Paul. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Paul, for being there and being the technical support and uh, the background background researcher there sounds like so <laughs> yeah so if you have some if you have some, have some questions you know contact me you know um because i try to put a lot of material in here in a short period uh, my presentation is usually an hour and a half long on the subject so uh, no, no um, doubt that's without the intro that's 
straight on the material itself. All right. Well, so. thank you so much. We appreciate your time, and and uh, we'll be we'll be we'll look to have you back maybe and in the springtime when it's time to feed. You guys take care and stay safe. Thank you. And uh, just quick, Jeff, we'll get all of that contact information up on the web page. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Katharina. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Kim, uh, handle the show for a few minutes. I'm going to go grab a couple bananas and go feed the bees. <laughs> well, grab a couple for me, will you? Because like I said earlier, I like to eat, and I'm not giving my bees my bananas, let me tell you. Right now, I, there may be some value there, but... Uh, I draw the line somewhere. <laughs> that was a pretty interesting discussion. So I, I, yeah, and I think I think it's great that she took on the initiative to run these trials. I hope she does a, a follow up, larger scale study and gets these published um, in in peer reviewed journals. I do think that's still really important for for results. And, but I also love that that beekeepers are jumping in feet first and and getting their hands dirty. <laughs> well, that's. Uh, that was a fun, fun discussion, and it's, this whole entire episode has been fun, uh, if not slightly controversial with the invasive species and honeybees uh, and uh, native pollinators and feeding bananas to bees. It's been a good show. It's been fun. I'm glad you could come along this time, Kirsten. Oh, it, it's been fun. I know I, I often have strong opinions on this. I just... I, I've spoken to so many beekeepers who that really was their first window into ecosystem services and how plants and pollinators are connected. And I, I think that's a very important voice because beekeepers become touchstones. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all experienced, you go to a party, they're like, oh, you keep bees? And all of a sudden you're the center of attention and people are asking you countless questions. And what you tell them about changes in that you've made in your backyard has these ripple effects, right? I have friends now sending me videos, not of honeybees, but of all these native pollinators that show up on their balconies in Berlin. And they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be as aware except for the fact that we are friends. So yeah, it's, it, I, think, I think of honeybees as a gateway bug. Yeah. All right, well, that about wraps it up for the podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast what you like about this one. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And we want to thank Strong Microbials for becoming the latest supporter of our podcast. Check out their full probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kirsten, Kim? Well, Jeff, I'm going to tell you, if I'm going to feed my bees anything, it's going to be, it's going to be the global patties patty rather than my bananas. <laughs> As it should be. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>